Welcome back to our second part of the interview with Dr. Roberta Klatsky at Carnegie Mellon University. We're continuing to talk about haptic perception and some of the modern interfaces that include haptic feedback. So we've talked about kind of the general principles of haptic perception to some degree. Um, I know that you're interested in interfaces and how people can explore um, through their sense of touch mediated through some kind of computer system, textures or objects that aren't really present but are only virtually present. Could you give us a little bit of an overview of how that works? Well, I could. I think that uh, many people have probably been in immersive 3D environments where they're wearing, say, a helmet that gives them stereo cues, or even the Omnimax probably gives you some degree of sensation of being in a very real environment. Um, the head-mounted displays give you stereo cues, so you think you're actually in 3D. And you think, gee, this is a, a, a very uh, interesting phenomenon because I can create perceptual worlds that don't exist just by bringing to my sense organs the very same cues that they would have if I were in these environments. So the uh, visual world for doing this is all around us and in fact 3D movies are coming online. Of course they were online back in the 50s I think but they're coming again and I think it's very exciting for people to be so immersed in a reality, uh, perceiving things that aren't there, and then you come to the sense of touch, and you say, oh, dear. Now, there is a problem because it seems like I really need physical objects in order to touch them. So how could I possibly create a virtual environment in which objects are felt? And that leads to the idea that you could somehow bring forces or temperatures or vibrations to the hand that would somehow mimic the feelings that we have when we touch real objects. So how is that then solved, this problem? It's solved in various ways by different people. In fact, force feedback is becoming um, a, a very, I won't say big industry, because there's still a small number of devices. But I do think that now, with devices like the iPhone, the idea of delivering real forces as opposed to just clicks when you contact, is going to be very exciting to a broader spectrum of people. But there are a handful of devices that have been developed. And you can also use uh, very cheap devices like the motors from cell phones, which just vibrate against your fingers, to create not a real feeling of an object, but to tickle touch in a way that might help you uh, think that there's an object out there. So uh, a number of devices uh, do exist. So what are the particular devices that you have worked with? I've worked uh, with a vibrating device, just putting a vibrator on each finger that simulated contact. So people move their hands in the air, and when they touched a virtual object, they uh, got a tingle in that finger. And I think the vibrators we used were small speakers from Radio Shack. They cost about 50 cents a piece at the time. And then at the higher end, I've worked with an absolute uh, state-of-the-art uh, device that's been developed here at Carnegie Mellon by my colleague Ralph Hollis who developed an interface that relies on magnetic levitation technology. So how does that work? In magnetic levitation haptics device, you have a floating bowl. And it floats in a field of magnets. The magnets create forces on the, on the bowl. And uh, you hold a handle that is actually uh, mounted to the bottom of the bowl. And you move the handle in space. And you can actually move it. You can rotate it and tilt it. Uh, not over a large workspace, but over a fairly small space. And then the computer keeps track of where you are. There are optical sensors on this bowl, so you, your position can be tracked. And it's related to a computer model of the world that says, oh, over here in this space, there's a wall. So if I push my handle in that direction, I'll feel a very uh, firm resistance. Or over here in the, in the uh, in the world, there is a soft surface. So if I push against that, I'll feel something more compliant and spring-like. So the computer itself creates a spatial world of surfaces that, in moving the handle, you encounter and get the forces simulating actual en encounters with those places and surfaces in space. So through that device, you can then explore different parts of that simulated environment to see kind of what are the the density, what's the density, what's the hardness, what's the smoothness of it. So you might also get some kind of 
if it, if it were the object that I just touched with the sh sharp ridges, for example, we would get this kind of behavior as well in that particular environment, if I went up and down? Yes, but you have to remember you're holding a handle, and it's uh, most of the devices that have been developed don't try to simulate touching the world with your bare finger. That's a very hard problem, but rather touching it through some kind of rigid intermediary, like holding a stick and probing the world with a stick. So in the case of the handle, in fact, you're probing the world with a stick. And the computer can model different kinds of ends on the stick. They can be sticky, or they can be large, they can be spherical, or they can be pointy. And as long as you have an algorithm that will compute the physical interactions with the world you've created, you can send back to the hand what would happen if they wielded that kind of tool in that kind of environment. But what's a very uh, far frontier, I think, is having any kind of um, device that could stimulate your bare skin and feel totally natural as if you were touching a virtual object. Right. So right now, this device, for example, would be limited to any kind of haptic exploration where you literally would use a stick to explore objects. And so you can see how good an interface like that could be by just closing your eyes and exploring things, something with a stick because it can't be better than that. Uh, yes, although we could create sticks that would be very hard to make in the real world, yes, okay. it's still a stick. However, there are lots of very useful tasks where people wield sticks and one of them is surgery. So not surprisingly, in fact, these devices have become quite of interest for surgical training and surgical s uh, simulation. They can create uh, gallbladder surgeries for the very novice gallbladder surgeons so that Perhaps that will work better than working on real gallbladders for a while. They can train people to do lumbar pu punctures, that is, going through the crevices and the vertebrae in order to reach the spinal cord. Uh, so, in fact, uh, these, this feeling with the stick, although I, uh, I agree that it is very limited, is not so different from many of the things that are done in very useful environments in the real world. And I, I would assume that if it's used for surgeon training, that they also would have an immersive visual environment together with the haptic environment, or is it just the haptic environment that's being simulated? Uh, it's a certainly a visual environment. It isn't necessarily immersive. It may just be a monitor. What, because surgeons themselves, remember, may not be able to see. Now that we have so much laparoscopic surgery, it's not uncommon for surgeons to be looking at a monitor and, in fact, viewing something that a camera inside the patient is actually seeing. So uh, it doesn't have to be the full helmet-mounted display, head-mounted display with the 3D stereo cues that's involved.